Okay, we finished up on the two first points. Now let's finish up for today with the, this question about this logistics. Um, there is, as it says here, a certain document which kind of may be helpful for you to read. It, uh, as I said previously, it kind of defines logistics also in, the, in, in an event setting. But uh, today I will try to focus more on general logistics, I think, than this uh, event perspective. We will return to it later in the course anyway. Uh, if this works, it should be possible to... Oh, it worked, yeah. Yeah, you can see something written by me, our present director, and uh, Nigel Halpern here. And it says something about uh, the planning on this study program, actually. And it's perhaps this um, 2 1 and 2 1 1 you should read if you want to get something out of it. Okay, uh, in explaining logistics, I think I will uh, like to return to last year's event economics course, actually. So let's see if I can find it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, here it is, isn't it? Let's look at uh, chapter 6. Uh, this will be some um, repetition. Okay, we start here. I think we start with this slide here. If you rem recall from the course we had in uh, event economics, uh, we discussed various parts of uh, economic theory. One part was the production economics part. And in the production economics part, we introduced this production function. It's uh, written on the top of this slide here. Q equals a function of K and L, where K is capital and L is labor. Uh, it also says later on here that it, it, is, it is a gravely simplified theoretical description of all firms. Logistics as a science deals with far more advanced and detailed description of firms. So I think we should start here in a sense. Okay? Um, uh, if we want to draw a picture here, we can think of a company or a firm or a factory, whatever you like it, as a box here. And we input capital and we input labor, and out comes our product in units, if you like. So this is kind of the setting we look at when we do it in microeconomics. Uh, as this kind of should tell us, uh, in logistics, we are kind of more interested in a much more detailed pattern here. And it's kind of these details that we should start thinking about, I think, to understand what logistics is about. Let's uh, think about this part L here. What we can do in this description here is to kind of add a little bit more L and get a little bit more output. In reality, it's typically far more complex, isn't it? Typically, this L is decomposed into different categories, isn't it? If you think about a symphonic orchestra, we have those who play the violins, we have those who play the trumpet, we have others who play different stuff, don't they? They play clarinets and saxophones and whatever, okay? And typically, it's not necessarily such that those who play a trumpet is very good at playing violins and vice versa. So there's different skills here we have to think about if we want to compose a workforce. This is, of course, not restricted to symphonic orchestras. It's everywhere. At the hospital, for instance, we have doctors, we have nurses, we have laboratory personnel, we have those who take x-rays, there's very different skills here involved. Some of them could overlap, somebody can do different things. It could be that the guy who could play a violin could also play a viola, or maybe even a full bass, I don't know. It's the same kind of instrument, but it's bigger and smaller, isn't it? So you, you could have people that could kind of overlap different skill categories. Please enter. If you're lucky now, you can show your face in the camera. <laughs> <laughs> And this kind of thing, of course, is not modeled here at all, is it? We just put some more labor in and we get some more product out. We cannot necessarily put more labor in. It could be certain parts of labor we can put in with certain qualifications that could lead to the wanted increase or decrease in output. 
So these parts are kind of obvious, isn't it? That we, there's much more here to a real factory or a real company than just these single dimension labor. It's different dimensions. And of course, it could be that the availability here is kind of decomposed over time. So if you think about the hospital, there are certain time regulations, isn't it? You cannot work forever. You have to take a break and then someone else must come in before you can do it again. There are certain laws in Norway that says that certain persons are not allowed to work overtime, for instance, for a certain amount of time. These must be calculated into our planning. If you think about this part of this figure, there's some, something obviously missing here, isn't it? The product here is kind of ready for sale instantaneously. Both time-wise you have a problem, that there is certain time involved in producing, isn't it? And then we produce a certain physical object, like cars or PCs or iPads or whatever, we cannot kind of turn on a button and suddenly it pops out. It takes some time, doesn't it? And if we turn on a button on the machine, it could well be that, that that machine takes some time before it's ready to produce. And it could well be that if we, pr for instance, produce uh, soft drinks, that if we produce a certain soft drink, then we can change to another one without doing anything. But if we produce another one, then we have to do something. If we produce water, then it's okay, isn't it? But if we produce cola, then we might have to wash the machine before we start producing water. You see? It's kind of obvious, isn't it? But this is a far more complex history than this very simple production function in microeconomics. So this is related to the inners here. Okay, there may be certain constraints saying that if we do this, we have to do that, and then we can't do that, and so on. All these kind of stuff will have to be taken care of. We cannot uh, rely on this extreme simplified version when it comes to real planning or real operations. Another obvious thing here is that this one, looked away from this, doesn't say anything about the location of our production. and our consumers. Okay. Typically, today, there is a vast distance between where we produce thing and where we consume it. So we have to put something in between here. We call that transportation, don't we? We have to transport our goods, typically, to other countries, from that country, to a kind of storage place, from that storage place, to various shops. So there's a whole chain here, operations, which are not looked at at all here. When it comes to the capital side, again, it could be constraints, couldn't it? We cannot have free access to capital. It could be certain amounts we can use. If we want to have more, we have to do a lot of debates with banks and financing people and so on to get the money. So again, on this side, there is certain thing that constrains us, typically in practice. And logistics is about implementing this stuff into real planning. And typically, as I said, we kind of look at relatively short time horizons, a week, a month, maybe a year, uh, when we do planning decisions. Okay, roughly speaking. Uh, we can look at uh, a definition of logistics, if you like, maybe that's a good point to do something. Uh, mm, 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 mm. We can go to Google, can't we? And look for logistics. And then we can look at Wikipedia. <coughs> and if it's possible to see this now, there is a definition on top here, isn't it? It says here that logistics is the management of the flow of resources. Let's stop there, okay? What do you mean by management here, do you think? I think we can think about this as planning. Okay? We have to make plans on how to deal with the resource resources that flows between the point of origin, which is kind of is the producing unit, and the receiver, which is the consumer. So we kind of have a location where we produce something. We have to decide how to produce it how to kind of handle all these constraints which is involved in, in the production. And then we have to make other decisions, whether we should transport it ourselves, 
where we should transport it, in what matter should we have an inventory part, or should we not have it, should we produce for inventory. Uh, when you buy an iPad, of course, you can place an order on the Apple website, but you don't know wh when it's produced, do you? You can read it when you get it, it has a serial number. Typically, it's not produced based on your order, it's pre-produced, so it has been stored in a certain amount of time before you, you get it. This is various. Uh, it changes when it, uh, if you look at the product li life cycle. So th there are certain elements which are typically discussed in logistics. One is transport, the other is production, and the third is inventory. <coughs> inventory is storing stuff before selling it at a later point in time. So these three components are in a sense in a normal definition of logistics. If you look at the definition here, it's a bit more extended, isn't it? Between the point of origin and the point of consumption in order to meet some requirements, for example, of customers or corporations. The resources managed in logistics can include physical items, such as food, materials, equipment, liquids and staff, which is people, which is down here, <laughs> as well as abstract items such as time, information, particles, and energy. We could add entertainment here as well, couldn't we? Which in, in principle is the same, which is kind of the topic of this course. It doesn't say that here, but it could very well have been added. The logistics of physical items usually involves the integration of information flow, material handling, production, packaging, inventory, and transportation. You see this blue? is at least close to these three points. Okay. I, I choose to kind of keep it like this. Relatively simple, try to decompose it into three part subjects. Transportation, production, inventory. Uh, when it comes to transportation, our topic at hand here, which is event logistics, is somewhat special, isn't it? Normally if you think about classical logistics, classical manufacturing, the situation is such that you produce something somewhere and you transport that to the consumer location. What's the situation when it comes to events? Think events cannot be transported. No, so what do you do then? You produce them as they come. Yeah, who, who come? The customer is moving, aren't they? The customers are moving to the production location. So it's kind of opposite. So it's a different type of transportation structure entirely when it comes to events compared to normal products, so to speak. If you produce a car in Germany, you put it on a boat, you send it to Drammen or Oslo or whatever, and somebody drives it up to a... or you put it on a, these big cars, you've probably seen them, or you can have six or eight cars standing, and you drive it up to a retailer somewhere. <coughs> So already we kind of seen a major difference between events and normal production. Of course, this difference should have some implications when we treat it and deal with it. It does not mean that you don't have transportation problems when it comes to events, because you have to make sure that the customers you would like to come to your event actually comes, or has the potential to come there. You probably, some of you might remember that we had a world championship in skiing in Oslo some years ago, 2011. It was a big issue that many of these potential spectators didn't actually arrive at the stadium due to lack of transportation uh, opportunities. So obviously if you want to arrange a football match in Molde, you need to be certain that those people you kind of want to come are able to come. In that case it could be bad to have a match on Saturday compared to on, sa on Sunday. You know all about this Jonas, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, so you probably know that, that there is normally less people on these matches on Saturdays than on Sundays. The reason is straightforward, because uh, on Saturdays people do other things, they go to their cottages, they travel around, on Sundays they are preparing for the next week, and then it's easier to, to get them into these matches. And these are not unimportant stuff when it comes to event planning. So logistics, as we see it, see it I think, should uh, be <coughs> focusing on these three subtopics. And uh, we should kind of get the feel that we talk about kind of short-term problems, we talk about what we refer to as operational problems, meaning that we engage in actually how to do things, really how to do things. <coughs> <coughs> 
A lot of people say that logistics is everything. That is not correct. Logistics is definitely not everything, neither company-wise nor event-wise. There's a lot of decisions which are not logistics decisions and which are very important decisions when it comes to producing various products. For instance, design is typically not defined as a part of logistics planning, even though, of course, it has logistics implications. If you make choose one design over another design, it has both production and transportation and inventory implications. But typically, in most companies, it's not logistics people who handle design decisions. In principle, it should be. It should be a kind of cooperation between those who handle the logistics and handles the design, but that is very uncommon. So that is one typical decision which is not normally kind of captured in logistics problems. Another important one is pricing. When you have designed your product, you have to design, you have to define the price, don't you? And there's a lot of prices around here. Uh, many companies may have tens of thousands of products and each product must have a price, of course, to be to obtain a, a market transaction and in that case pricing is needed. Lately uh, pricing has by many people been argued that it should be a part of logistics decisions. Of course there is a link here between for instance production capacity and pricing. If you, if you have a kind of uh, fixed production capacity, meaning how much you can produce over time, it's fairly obvious that if, if there is market, if there is time fluctuations in the demand, so that you, you have, let's say, you sell more in the summer than in the winter, it could be very sensible to use prices to kind of smoothen this demand, so you then, then you would typically have larger prices in the summertime to kind of take it down, and you could have smaller prices in the wintertime to, to kind of stimulate demand, to, to kind of make a match between demand and capacity. Most products will have these fluctuations, and, and this is of course a challenge that we will return to it to some extent when we discuss events. Uh, event planning is uh, in some ways easier than normal production, in other ways more difficult. For instance, it's fairly uncommon to pre-sell products in normal manufacturing, even though we see more and more of it, don't we? You can see, for instance, computer games that you pre-sell them. You say you can sign on here to get when it comes. Uh, but it's more uncommon in normal retail than it is in events. In events, of course, it's fairly normal that you sell tickets before the event. Why do we do that? Yeah, we capture some information, don't we? That gives us some information on the total demand in the end. That's one thing. And that is perhaps because we are uncertain on how many people that arrives on our event. So in order to do all these other planning we need to do, to how many sausages, sausages to buy, how many soft drinks to buy and so on, we need some information telling us how many people will end up. Mm. And that, that part is logistics planning, isn't it? Deciding on how much sausages to buy, how, where to sell them, what price to take on and so on, even though I said pricing here is not a logistics decision. So, do you have any other typical company decisions which typically are not in logistics? Uh, a lot of people say that choice of technology is not a logistics decision. That is a question on... Uh, obviously, choice of technology is closely related to this, the, the design we choose. If we choose to design our product in a certain way, we may need certain types of te technology. If we choose another design, we may need other types of technology. But again, it's, it's not that far from the problems we have discussed. It has certain implications for our lo logistics. If we if we choose a certain set of machines, then we can produce in one way. Choose other machines, then we can produce in another way. 
which of course again is linked into what we have defined as logistics decisions. So I don't say that, of course, in principle, everything is woven in together. But normally, you, you kind of, if you look at a normal company, the guys doing this, and of course the guys doing this, are not defined as logistics people. We find uh, the logistics people, in a sense, on the floor to some extent. They are uh, in the inventory part. They, they are. Uh, Decide, deciding in, uh, what to produce and how and so on. So at least these four subjects here are normally not defined as logistics subjects. Even though again, of course, marketing is important if you market uh, very heavily and get more customers than expected, of course, that will have implications on how your logistics will work and how it should or should not behave. As I said, is said previously, a lot of people uh, argue that logistics is everything. And it's, it's possible to do that, in a sense, like we have done now. But uh, I prefer to look more traditionally at, at, at it and kind of limit it to, to, to this way of thinking. And we will do that in this course, because I think it's, it's easier to, to kind of capture the essentials of the topic when we do it like that. <coughs> Do you have any questions so far? Or you're getting what I'm trying to tell you to some extent? <coughs> Today we have some forces running in the world economy and most experts seem to believe that these forces will continue to grow. And the most important force perhaps is what we refer to as globalization. You know what that is? To some extent, uh, globalization, uh, as I see it, is kind of developing uh, due to some facts. Okay, we have observed that transportation costs has gone down dramatically. Taking a plane for me from Oslo to New York is relatively much cheaper today than it was 30 years ago. 30 years ago, it was close to half a year's salary today, it's, it's feasible, isn't it? So most people can, can travel relatively far at relatively low cost. Obviously the same is the case for products, okay? As long as people can be transported relatively cheaply, also product can be. So it means that, that producers almost everywhere can produce for consumers almost everywhere at a relatively low cost. And most experts seem to believe that uh, these costs are even going further down in the future. Uh, in practice, it means, of course, that you can uh, produce uh, at <coughs> for long dis distance transportation, and the markets are kind of growing for everybody. Everybody everywhere can produce for everybody everywhere. And then, of course, it's obvious that you can um, you can look at uh, the economic side in a bit, uh, in, a, in a different way. In addition to these force, we see forces, at least in Europe, or also worldwide, that uh, uh, the tendency to kind of lower these barriers for importing and exporting is kind of important. For instance, the European Union is kind of based on these principles, isn't it, of free competition. Uh, it should be possible for everybody to compete with everybody. And these forces together, if you look at lowering the transportation costs and these political processes, it kind of moves into more uh, uh, and bigger competition, uh, should, at least in my opinion, lead to uh, a greater importance of logistics as a tool. Because in, if you kind of look forward now, uh, and think about the old way of competing is kind of, I have a good idea, I produce a good product, I get a patent on that product, and I produce that product for a certain amount of years, and nobody else produces that product. Today it's kind of different, isn't it? Uh, of course, all these guys, they try to get patents. If you look at Apple, they, 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 they file maybe 10 or 15 or 50 or 100 patents every week, trying to keep these kind of local monopoly, uh, owning the rights to produce this product alone. 
But if you look at what's happening, you, you see that, for instance, in China, there is a lot of... Uh, we could call it copying. That's perhaps what it is. And uh, there are certain factories to do that. And uh, most of the Japanese success on, in the 70s was, was some kind of copy-based, wasn't it? They produced... First, they produced electronic products based on copies from the, the United States. Of course, they developed it further. They started producing cars. These cars were bad in the start. Then they focused on quality and, and uh, re re reliability. And they managed to kind of get the Japanese car being a special product. But in many cases, uh, we, would, uh, we would expect that these opportunities of kind of keeping this ID for yourself is, is vanishing. Uh, another cost component which has uh, decreased dramatically is, is, of course, the cost of information. By internet, we kind of access not only uh, producers everywhere, but we also access information on the content of these products. Much more cheap than at any point in time. And if this development keeps on, we could expect a kind of world where everybody can produce everything, uh, copying or not copying. And of course, in that sense, what you can compete on is your internal production process. That is kind of what you can keep as your own. So if you produce your products more efficient than anybody else, then you could expect to win the competition. And the need for product IDs, nice design, good marketing, is perhaps not so big in that kind of world. So what, what remains to compete on is perhaps then logistics. This kind of argument is very, should we say, uh, makes people who work with logistics very happy, doesn't it? Because it tells you that in the long run, it's how you produce your products that defines whether you will win a competition or lose. You cannot kind of rely on a long-term ID anymore. Because anybody can copy your product if you like it or not. And it's very hard to keep these patents running efficiently. If you look at events, the story is kind of different, isn't it? Because an event is by definition a monopoly. There is only one Rolling Stones. Of course, you can produce a band which looks like Rolling Stones, plays exactly like Ro Rolling Stones, but still it wouldn't sell. The willingness to pay for this copy is perhaps there, but it, in magnitude it's not close to looking at the real thing. The same with Barcelona. The same there. You can perhaps... It, 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 it is, of course, difficult to construct a team that plays like Barcelona. Everybody knows that. It, it's almost impossible. It, it, but in principle, it's possible. But it would still not be Barcelona. It would not drag money as Barcelona does, to no extent. So when it comes to the event side, you can kind of still hope for the possibility possibility to keep this monopoly also in the future. So you, you can construct a brand, and if that, that brand is kind of constructed strong enough, it could kind of keep these competitive forces away, even in the future. You see my point? So in that sense, uh, you could <coughs> argue, as I do know, that in events, perhaps logistics isn't that important. Because my argument previously was that when it comes to products, uh, logistics will be important due to the fact that these forces will kind of lead to a more perfect competition. But uh, I know I say that in, in the event side, it could be such that the monopoly could be regained even further. And we kind of see this due to the examples I, I told you about. But still, this does not mean that logistics is not important when it comes to events. Of course, it's still important to do things efficiently if you want to make money on your event. And of course, that is the kind of glasses we should use in a course like this. So the idea now, and in the future then, is to, is to as I said, to kind of learn you some basic logistics first, uh, and, and then to move into what kind of tweaks and tricks we have to do to kind of transfer this knowledge, knowledge into the event side. That is the, the kind of uh, plan we have. Now let's round up this day by 
hitting the keyboard first. To and we can take out this Wikipedia page now, I think, and start talking a little bit about the consequences when it comes to planning here. <coughs> uh, on the left here, we have we put up some kind of areas where companies make decisions. Of course, they make a lot of other decisions as well. We, we should perhaps have talked about uh, the decisions related here, the kind of people you hire, the kind of people you fire, if that is an option, which also is normally not a part of logistics planning in, in companies, but uh, we will uh, we'll see that it uh, it is uh, by all means important if you want to to do at least short-term uh, decisions related to, to, to pure logistics. Uh, if we make all these decisions under this top line here, we design our product, we decide which pr prices it should have, we do our marketing, we choose our technology, if we do those, if we make those decisions, then something will kind of pop out, wouldn't it? Uh, we could call that what pops out as demand, okay? That's uh, the number of people that will buy our products. The prices are defined, the design is made, so okay, then we end up at a certain point in time that there is some customers knocking on our door saying, we want to buy this product. <coughs> if we want to make these deci decisions we talked about here, which people to put in, how we should produce it, uh, how we should transport it and so on. Then to make these decisions, we need to have a certain information on how many people will buy our product and where they will buy it. Do you agree? We need to know how many people will buy it. So needing we, if, if I want to transport something from a, a production location to a certain customer location, I need to know how many customers will I will expect to buy it there. If it's a, lot, it's a high number, I need to do some kind of transportation planning. If it's a low number, I do something else. I might even skip it totally, if you see my point. So demand is very important in logistics. We need to kind of have some information or beliefs on our demand structure. This is both geographically dispersed as well as time. I need to know where and when. And this information is kind of the starting point for all logistics planning, the demand information. I need to have predictions or forecasts on demand. That is absolutely vital. If I don't have that, I can't do any logistics planning. If you think about events, this is kind of obvious, isn't it? If you want to run the, 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 the jazz festival here, you need to have a certain information on how many spectators will arrive and when they will arrive and how they will divide on the different concerts. Because at each concert you will have to make some arrangements, how many chairs should be available, how many should be standing, how many beers will I sell and all these kind of stuff. Okay? If I don't have this information, it's impossible for me to make a good experience for the audience and that is of course a part of the story. Jonas has been working at Molde selling tickets. Have you done anything else, Jonas? This summer? Yeah. I've been the head of the ticketing when Lars was on vacation, so I've been taking a few calls and stuff like that. But you haven't been engaged in the food service and that kind of stuff? No. no. Uh, only you've been a receptionist and taking phone calls and yeah. Yeah, distributing customers further to uh, of course, one thing which is obvious when it comes to events or products is that, is that we want our customers to, to return. We want either to come next year and then the year after and so on, and we'll probably want even more of them to come. So we have to give them a good experience, don't we? We have to provide uh, satisfaction in all kinds of, of stuff. So it means uh, if we want to have a concert with Rolling Stones, first of all, so Rolling Stones must show up. Okay, that's one point. If you sell tickets to Rolling Stones, they, then they should be there, okay? That's uh, kind of obvious, but that's not all. We need to get seats for those who want to sit. We need to get standing places for those who want to stand. We might need, we might need some wide screens for those who stand a long, long, way, long way back. We need toilets. <coughs> we need uh, food and drinks. We might, may, may need special transportation in and out. And all these will have to be decided, doesn't it? 
And this course is about how, how we do make those decisions. It's not obvious, is it? Because we normally don't know how many comes. We might have a guess, we might have a feeling, but when we break it down to various subparts or events, then it becomes even more uncertain, doesn't it? If you look at the jazz festival, they, I don't know how many concerts they had this year. Let's say they had 250, 300 perhaps, different artists. Some of the artists may have multiple concerts, but still it's a, a kind of a puzzle to, to make all these work, isn't it? To the satisfactory of the customers. And we all ha hear these stories that in many cases the customers are not satisfied. They, they maybe they d normally they get, of course, the right artist, but apart from that there's a lot of possibilities for dissatisfaction. So this planning is normally referred to as logistics planning and that's what we will talk about in this course. So we will start then with discussing demand and how to produce forecasts for demand. And that is not obvious how to do. Uh, again, when we do this in the first part of the course, we will discuss it in relation to normal products and how they do it there. Making forecasts on the future is not an easy task, as you probably know. It's not. Uh, if we were able to do that, we would be in infinitely rich, perhaps, because then we could say X. And we could uh, guess the lotto numbers and that would be easy. We can't do that, but we, there is some information available and very often historical information might provide interesting. So if you know who man, how many people attended the uh, Molde Vorderanga last year, we could perhaps expect a relatively similar number this year, given that Molde is as good as they was last year, which they are not. So it's perhaps not so easy to predict that either, okay? but we, we can do something to manipulate it, couldn't we? We could try to get a lot of young people from the schools down to the stadium. We could take down the prices on the tickets. We could do more marketing. There's a lot of things we can do to stimulate or to manipulate demand. And that is, of course, something we also will have to have in mind when we make these plans. We have to take that into account when we produce our forecasts. If you have a plan for changing demand, then that plan must be a part of our planning to produce the forecasts. Okay, that was more or less what I ex thought I should say today. So maybe there is some questions, comments. There is no. Okay, then uh, there is a little homework for tomorrow. <coughs> we need a little homework, don't we? Yeah. Okay. Now I'll introduce you to a web page. I don't know whether you have seen it. It's called academia.edu. Have you seen that? No. Never? Okay. No, academia.edu is some kind of Facebook for academic people. You are, you are approaching these academic people now, so you should know what it is, okay? Now, if I uh, search here, let's say, let me search for Molde. See if I find something. Yes, Molde University College, nine people. Yeah, you see here we have some people who have kind of uh, members of this uh, community. There is uh, a certain amount, 12 people at the Department of Economics, Social Science and Informatics, where you are a part now. Uh, there is somebody who has defined the logistics category. Somebody has even defined the sport management category here. So you, what I want you to do is to define uh, an event management category here. We can look uh, see here who is here. Do you know anybody of these people? This guy seems familiar. He was a student in the economics course, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah. I have to, to get in here, I have to... Yeah, here he is. He seems to have written some papers. But th this is a simple task, isn't it? Some of you can, either one of you or all of you. Or you should uh, produce a picture of yourself and, uh, and uh, put yourself in here. Uh, this is kind of a neat place. You can... Um, Put up uh, all your production here. Let's see if you can find me here. I, ca I can probably log in. Maybe that's better. Let's let me log in. Log in. I can log in on myself, you know, then it's... Uh yes, uh, I need to give a password here. Uh, that was not correct. Let me try again. 
demonstrating logging on web pages is always a now let's see. No, oh, let's see if it works. Ah, it worked. Okay. Now what you can do here is that you can uh, you can enter uh, information about yourself, of course, but also what you have written. Okay, that's the main point here. So it kind of contains a kind of history for people on their writings and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it has a very nice uh, feature here, which um, kind of tells you which people reads what you've written. So if you look at me here, you can see that. Um, if this internet can uh, cooperate a little bit. You can see in what areas of the world, for instance, people read what I've, re I've written. But uh, it's not cooperating. You can try to refresh. Maybe, maybe I can try to do this. Uh, 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 uh. It doesn't look... Uh, Ah, maybe something is happening here. Something is happening. Very slow, though. Yeah, this, of course, uh, kills all my previous arguments about the information uh, costs, uh, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you see here, uh, you see uh, counts per day and you see keywords and so on. But if you look here, it, it, this is kind of nice. Here you can see a picture of the world. Uh, on me then, just to, you see, I'm mostly popular in Norway, but I have a very strong community in Australia. I can see why, and then it's the United States. India is quite nice here, Vimani, you can see, and New Zealand, United Kingdom. This is just uh, the last month, actually. Even from Israel, one pe person from Israel. The Iran, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mexico, not bad, three, is that you? It's not you. It's not you. Okay. Okay. So, that's your homework for tomorrow. Make yourself visible on this website, and probably with a category called event management. That would be nice. Okay. So, I leave it to you. So, I will follow up tomorrow and see if you succeeded. Okay. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. And uh, good spirit, so we meet tomorrow at 12.15. Yes. Then we will start discussing forecasting, which is chapter 2 of this book. Okay. And we will follow it up more or less closely, I think. Okay? Have a nice uh, evening. See you tomorrow. <laughs>